One more thing for entrepreneurs, for those of you who are thinking of starting a new business, don't worry about reality. What you need to do is you need to create a business or a job that maybe doesn't exist, doesn't matter, that plays exactly to your strengths and joys. Eighty-three percent of Americans identify as not very happy, which can hold you back and negatively affect your relationships and your business. On this podcast, we discuss the proven steps to happiness, so you can restore balance and rekindle your joy. Welcome to another edition of How to Be Happier for Entrepreneurs. I hope everyone is doing fantastic today. As always, we're going to have an awesome show based on how you can find more happiness. My guest today is Mark Halpern. Mark, welcome. How are you, brother? Great, Brad. Thank you so much for inviting me to be on your podcast. It's great. Awesome. Yeah, it's going to be a fun half an hour. So let's just jump right in as we always do. You have um, successfully started and led multiple businesses. Can you share with us how prioritizing happiness in your professional life has contributed to the increased profitability of your ventures? Because people often think that money brings happiness, but we know different. We know happiness actually brings money. So tell us. Absolutely, Brad. That's, that's, that's really great. Uh, and, and happiness really is crucial. And, you know, it sounds all mushy and everything, but uh, I, I just like to start by defining what happiness is. You know, when you go to chat GPT and all and they say, oh, what is happiness? Oh, it's a subjective measure, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I now have an objective, uh, a very simple objective measure for happiness. And if we have time at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll go into the whole thing. But I do want to just mention what the goal is. So uh, and, and since happiness is about what we do with our time and our waking hours from birth to end of life, uh, I concluded that my goal and a lot of people are now adapting this is um, that the goal is to maximize the number of seconds that you enjoy without causing harm. That's it. An extremely well-defined, very simple uh, goal. Of course, it goes out to be you know, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-defined, so I have those as well. But qualitatively, the goal is to maximize the number of waking seconds that you enjoy without causing harm. That's, that's the goal. That's, that's the goal for happiness. So then the question becomes, what do you enjoy? And, and enjoyment, it doesn't have to be just me, me, me. It, it can be contributions to the community. You know, it can be, uh, you know, things that you're doing, you're mentoring others, you're in a, a house of worship. It, it can be so many different things that, that you enjoy that do good. But as long as you enjoy it and it doesn't cause harm to others, then then that's what's good. Now, once you enjoy things, the money comes. Now, I know that sounds, again, a little bit uh, vague, but if you're really enjoying something uh, and you're and you're good at it, then uh, and you create value and that's really good. So what I do in my various businesses, and I've got, I got, I have businesses in four different, uh, fields, which is a little bit strange. Uh, wow. then what I do is I love creating value through practical guidelines. That's just what I do. So my primary business is in chemistry. Uh, for those of you who can, or actually watching, you can see behind me, the, my primary business, which is phase transfer catalysis. On the other side, you can see a book that I wrote on that, 651 pages, launched a career there with that. And I just love creating guidelines for low-cost, high-performance green chemistry, which is good for the environment. And and I've, I've done 58 uh, two-day boot camps around the world in this. I've given lectures in 300 cities and 39 countries. I've saved companies $220 million. I stopped counting uh, 20 years ago. And I love doing that. It's It's just... It's intellectually stimulating to no end. And then people uh, like, like to hear about this. So it's really cool. Then the, another one, then I take what I, and my risk management skills from, uh, from R&D, uh, which I do breakthrough R&D, and I apply that now to private placement investing. So, and what I do there is I perform deep due diligence. I now have a group of 36 accredited investors that we, we perform deep due diligence together and we go to meetings and stuff like this. But the whole idea is that it's, it's taking patterns, recognizing patterns. So I like to create value through practical guidelines and how to maximize your uh, performance in investing. And of course, with using self-directed Roth 401k so that, you know, you're maximizing, uh, you know, perf tax performance. And now with the happiness that we're launching, I'm launching the, the platform now be happier uh, with the app and the book and the 
TED, I've given a TED talk, all those sorts of things. So I now have the uh, the, score, this, the thing called the happiness score, which we may or may not have time to talk about later on. And then a thing called the opportunity table, uh, which is which is on the app, which basically shows you which activities in life you do that you can uh, improve to uh, to achieve the goal of maximizing the number of seconds that you enjoy without causing harm. So that's that's how it all how it all fits wow, together. That's and, a lot. It's all, it's, it's all about analysis. Uh, yeah, and, and and creating and creating value for for humanity. So I love that. I mean, you said a lot, right? Um, maximum happiness. What is happiness? Maximum seconds that you enjoy in your waking hours. And being the self-love guy that I am, which I didn't always have self-love, but I found it in the last three years, I find it nearly impossible that someone could enjoy. Maybe that's a little stretch, but the more self-love you have, the more that you enjoy. Because if you are the opposite of self-love is self-contempt. So if you're constantly beating yourself up or irritated or drinking or eating or whatever the destructive things are, it's really hard to find enjoyment, right? <laughs> That's exactly right. So, Brad, if you don't mind me, uh, you're making a really important point, which uh, I, if it's okay, I'd like to just describe a little bit about the model for the happiness score because it fits in exactly to what you just said. Okay. So, uh, okay. So what I concluded is that happiness is about what you do with your time during your waking hours. And what I did is I, I, um, I divided time into four categories, invest time, spend time, waste time, and sleep. Invest time is time during which you're engaged in an activity that you enjoy that doesn't cause harm that we talked about that. That's what we're trying to maximize. Uh, sleep is sleep. So, uh, uh, I actually don't count sleep in there, uh, because you, know, you can't make decisions when you're sleeping. So spend time and waste time. Spend time is time during which you're engaged in activity that you do not enjoy, but would cause harm if you didn't do it, like paying bills, going to the bathroom, a few other things, okay? And that's where your score can't ever be 100 because you always have to pay bills, you know, to turn up your electricity. If you don't go to the bathroom, the law of conservation of matter dictates at some point you're going to explode. Um, <laughs> but then waste time is time during which you're causing harm to yourself or to others or the environment. So when you were talking about self-sabotage, and I listened quite, quite a lot to your really great podcast that I enjoy every one of them, uh, all the episodes. And, you know, you talk about things like uh, self-sabotage or the opposite of self-love, and that's waste time. And then what happens is that when you, uh, and again, our app is free, so it's not like I'm trying to promote uh, an app that, that makes money. I want everybody, I want to, we want to try and enable everybody in the world that has a cell phone uh, to be able to, you know, for free, whether they have money or don't have money to be happier. So what happens is that if you're doing things like self-sabotage, you're doing things like, like drinking, uh, uh, if you're doing anything illegal or bullying or, uh, or you know, hating or just anything, you know, uh, something that's breaking the law, uh, you know, you're doing illegal drugs, uh, judging other, you're judging doing, other uh, people. Abuse? Yeah, that's right. Uh, exactly. All, all these things that cause harm, you lose points in the app when you cause harm. So you gain, you gain one point per second that you enjoy. You don't get any points when you're spending time, which means you're not enjoying, but if you didn't do it, it would cause harm. And you lose a point for every second that you waste, which is causing harm. And then what happens is that if you're honest with yourself, and that's, you know, uh, in order to improve happiness, you sort of have to be honest with yourself. Sorry, that's, uh, I know it's hard to do, but being honest is, is just one of those things that you, if you really want to improve your performance. And then, um, and then the app shows you, it stares you in the face with your score, and it also identifies where you know how much time you're spending wasting and and and, uh, and investing and where you're doing that so you can you can uh, change so all the things you you talked about the opposite of self love i love that your self love concept, concept absolutely crucial uh and when we're doing the opposite of self love your score goes down and you see it and it, and it, that motivates you to change love it love it so a lot of people really struggle finding what they love to do can you walk us through how you discovered your passions and, and how this realization like influenced your, your career choices? Yes, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Actually, in 1997, I came up with a thing called the personal occupation analysis. Um, and uh, because I just, uh, you know, a lot of people were getting laid off in, in those period of time and, and a lot of people were having, uh, having issues and with jobs and things. And so what it is, it's, it's, a, it's an exercise, it's a mental exercise that you do preferably with somebody else who you trust and is open-minded. Uh, you can always find at least one person. Might, might be your life partner, might not. Might be somebody else. And the, the, um, the first thing you do is you simply uh, list. And we're talking about 
pages of material if you want. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take a few hours to do this, but hey, it's the happiest for the rest of your life. You know, in our work life, we have set about 78,000 hours of work life when you do the calculation. Wow. So the first thing you do is you, you write down, you make a list of all the activities you enjoy. Don't worry if it's marketable or not. Just don't even think about that. What do you enjoy? And write down everything you enjoy. I don't care if it's fishing or if it's watching Andy Griffith on TV. Now you've dated, I've dated myself on that. <laughs> or, or, or just anything. Now travel, whatever it might be. You write down all the things that you enjoy. And that list might be 30 to 50 items of, of things. And don't worry if it's marketable. The next thing you do is you write down all the skills that, that you have, whether you enjoy them or, you know, things that you're good at, things that you're maybe less good at, but no, no weaknesses. Don't, I, I don't care about, about weaknesses, strengths and skills that you have. And that also includes things like geography. So it could be like there was one person I was working with overseas and she was a very, very fast typist and, um, in a, in a, a court in, in, in court, she wasn't making a lot of money. Um, and it's a, it's a language that is uh, spoken by only a few million people. And I was able to show how she, uh, uh, she has a competitive advantage over 99.999% of the human population. And that's why she could take these particular skills instead of working in the court, she could work for in depositions uh, for, uh, for, for lawyers. Um, and, uh, because believe it or not, one of her skills is going to sound really strange. I shouldn't even say on the podcast when I was interviewing her, uh, this is 20 years ago, uh, I asked her about anything that she does that's different than other people. And she was a bit embarrassed. And she said, well, she, she actually can sit for eight hours without getting up to pee. Whoa. And, and you say, well, well, that is not something you would typically write down on a resume. <laughs> well, here's the thing. If, if she's one of the top three, uh, I, I think it's called court stenographers. I'm not sure. Yeah. One of the three fastest in the country and she doesn't have to get up to pee then that means that lawyers that are doing depositions, and I don't know if you've ever been in a deposition. I, I, I was a Unfortunately, in a chemical, yes. <laughs> in a chemical deposition. Yeah, they can be really brutal. So I, I was involved in this extremely, uh, it was hundreds of millions of dollar lawsuit between two chemical companies, and I sat in the deposition. And what they do is they, in some cases, uh, they'll try and break down somebody. But if you don't have somebody uh, recording, that that's all, let, let's stop the proceedings because the stenographer has to get up and pee. Uh, so, so, Mark, so, so Mark you, write, you, you write down, you write down everything that you absolutely love, and then you write down all of your strengths, and then where do you go from there? And the next thing then you do is that, and uh, is that uh, there are two more columns. I, I since some people are listening to this on uh, in their car, I'm not going to you know show the the form. Uh, what you do there are two more columns, and what you do is that you, the top ten things that you enjoy, you a variety of ways you can rank them. You can say you know, uh, categories one, two, and three. But anyway, you put in, in the left-hand column, in the gray column, the things that you enjoy the most. Then you put the the, uh, the column next to that in the white column, the, uh, the, the skills that you're the best at. And then you take this piece of paper that has all these different things in it, and you cut it up into strips. And then Anything that doesn't have any any numbers in the gray in the gray column or the white column, you throw away. Well, you don't throw away; you put them away. And the ones where, like, they're the top things that you enjoy, the things that your skills, you know, the top skills, then you start make you then combine them, and you start making combinations. For example, let me give you an example. Uh, in in my case, I was once selling somebody this, and uh, I speak Hebrew, and I'm really good in um, uh, in in uh, R and D management, research and development management. So I was just trying to show, hey, just to combine various things, what do you get? And I said, well, you know what? Since I know Hebrew and I know American R&D management techniques, I said, I bet you I, I can get a, a, a consulting job doing that. And I did. And I got a, a $10,000 contract. It was about two days of work. And I went to Israel and I started talking about the in, in R&D, in Hebrew, how I do this. And so there's all kinds of things. That just, maybe just one more thing when it comes to, to uh, because this is for entrepreneurs. Um, here's a little calculation. Let's say you're in the top three, let, let's say there's a certain job that needs, uh, three, um, three characteristics. Let's say it's an, and here's something which I did with a friend of mine. It was in 1995. Um, uh, his, his, actually his wife said, I love you. I'm taking, I can't take it here anymore. I'm moving back to Israel in that particular case. And he's an accountant. What are you going to do? Accounting, the laws of accounting are not portable from one country to another. So what I did, I sat down with him. We did this whole thing. 
And uh, he was a good accountant. So um, we did the analysis. If there's a, if there's a position in this in this case it was a job, but it could be a business as well. If there's a position that requires three characteristics, let's say you're really good in accounting, you have good interpersonal skills, um, and you're high IQ, something like that. Then if you're in the top 25 percent in each one of the three categories, then you do it's 0.25 times 0.25 times 0.25. That's a quarter of a quarter of a quarter of 16. You're in the top 98. Uh, 0.4 percent of the population if you can create a system a, a, a business for that now if you're in the top 10 percent that's 0.1 times 0.1 times 0.1 that's you're in the top 99.9 percent and now you've got a competitive advantage that nobody else can can do and in the end he got a job as controller in planet hollywood tel aviv why because planet hollywood needs american county Wow. And so, Mar so Mark, how the, the, this sheet, I, I love it. Like, like figure out what you really love, figure out what you're really good at. Um, and then combine, combine the ones that you are, you have your strengths and you're good at. Is that at the end of the podcast, we're going to share how to get the app and, and, and how to contact you. Is that something that's on your website that people can also get? Yes, uh, that's, it's all, it's all, it's done. I just have to do some formatting. It's going to be uh, available on the website probably the next two weeks. Boom, okay. uh, it's a, uh, it's a very, you know, it's like two dollars ninety nine cents. It says be available as an ebook, uh, and then, uh, but it's it's really it's really uh, it, it's easy to do, um, and and just one more thing for entrepreneurs, for those of you who think of starting a new business, don't worry about reality. What you need to do is you need to create a business or a job that maybe doesn't exist, doesn't matter, that plays exactly to your strengths and joys, exactly. And then the next step after that is then you back into reality and say, okay, so uh, now if it doesn't exist, hey, then maybe there's an opportunity for you to be have such a competitive advantage that you have no competitors. And if it does exist, now you have to figure out what are the resources uh, that are missing for, for reality. But Mark, th Mark, that's, it's, exact, it's, that's it's, exactly. It's worth, it's worth doing. It's yeah, worth doing. It's a few hours of work for the rest of your life, for heaven's sakes. Let's I, invest I a agree. few hours. So this it this is um this is exactly what I did with the business that I have now um how to be happy or or ha the happiness coach like I um I'm like I love this so much and I did, didn't even know it but I didn't find that I loved it so much until I actually went through it so what I've found with a lot of my clients is it's really hard to find your purpose when you lack self love because when you lack self love you're dealing with internal issues right you've got that proverbial lion chasing you you're always in a fight or flight state so literally within weeks of going through this transformation where i you know i reprogrammed these self limiting beliefs from my childhood i came back and i was like oh my gosh my life has changed so profoundly that i want to share this with others and that's what i did i didn't worry about the money i never this is the first business i've ever started where i didn't think about money and now I'm at the stage where, okay, now it's a business and now I got to make sure now, now reality is hitting me and I got to make sure, okay, now I've got overhead and I've got to make sure, cause I want to do this for the next 60 years. So I just have, I was actually coming back from the gym today saying, is this exactly what I want to be doing? What are the things in my business? It's so funny that we're having this conversation because I wasn't even thinking about you, but it's like, there are certain things in my business that I don't love doing. So how can I extract myself from that and do more of this? Talking to people like you, talking to clients who are struggling, uh, getting on stages. Those are the things I love to do. So I, as a business owner, control my own destiny. So I've got to spend some time over the next you know, month or so figuring out how can I design this business so that I can do exactly what I want to do every single day. Oh, that's, that's great, Brad. I, I'd like to share with you something which I learned from uh, a, a brilliant man, his name is Bob Wells, was on December 2nd. We were in this in this workshop. So I need to uh, give Bob Wells the, the credit for this. He's built, I think, $4 billion in businesses. Wow. So something that, that has to do uh, with what you just said. Um, and it was a revelation for me. It was just what, two months ago. And he said like this, in a business, there are three types of, there are three categories of uh, performers. There's the entrepreneur. So first he says, how many people in the room are entrepreneurs? Of course, I raised my hand because I built these four businesses. And, and uh, but by the end of it, but five minutes later, I was not an entrepreneur anymore. It's just like this. There's entrepreneurs, there are managers, and there are skilled producers. This is Bob Wells stuff. So please, I'm not plagiarizing stuff. I'm just giving all the credit to Bob. It's phenomenal. So entrepreneurs are people that have vision and, a, and they have a passion for growing a business. They don't, uh, and we're going to, I'm oversimplifying here, but uh, an entrepreneur has the vision and the passion to grow their business, but not necessarily uh, likes the details. That's Manager, me. Love that's, that's, that's me. <laughs> that's right. 
uh, great. So now we're going to, uh, so now, exactly. And so now we're going to talk about, and was what Bob made me realize, uh, and hopefully you know, through me, uh, Bob's stuff will come to you as well. You, you have the passion for going to business, but not the details. And I don't like the details of the manager. Managers love details. They're going to be like human resources or, you know, who's going to set up the podcast and who's going to hire the people in Upwork to do the, whatever right, it is. Right. Right. And, and, and they love order. They want order. They want, everything's got to be in its place. And because you have to have somebody in the business who's doing that stuff. The accounting. I hate accounting. I'm really good at it because I hate doing it twice. So I, I do it really, really well. And then the third category is skilled producer. Oh, and the managers, the, the managers, ideally the managers don't care about vision and growing the business. They just want to have an order, things in order. Right, right. And then, the, and then there's skilled producers. Skilled producers are the people that create value directly for the customer. The entrepreneur doesn't do that. The manager doesn't do that. The skilled producers are the ones that are creating the products and services that are of direct value to the customer. And then he said, okay, so those of you who raised your hand, entrepreneur, which was me, uh, said, okay, which, which one of the three do you like the most? Which one of uh, the three do you like the least? And I said, holy crap, I love creating content. Now, I, lo I, lo I love growing the business, but I love creating content more than anything. And I don't want to manage. God, oh, gee. So then, uh, something which I learned about 30 years ago, there are two types of activities that you can do, things that you're uniquely qualified to do, and everything else is an MWA, which is minimum wage activity. Now, in my industry, minimum wage activity might be getting $150,000 a year, but any engineer can design a reactor. Not every chemist can design, can achieve a breakthrough in phase transcatalysis that takes uh, creativity. Engineers so, are so Mark, so, so, so Mark, so you, you outsource the MWAs. Does that make you the fact that you like to do content? Because I, I've, I've literally thought I could, I could read books and do content all day and be happy. Does that make you a skilled producer? Does that make me a skilled yes. producer? Yeah, yes, yes, it does. Now, you, you can have, you can enjoy two of the three or all three if you want, but, but the question is what you enjoy the most. So, what I'm trying to do uh, in the last, uh, well, I, I became a full time entrepreneur in 1995. So, however many years that is, let's say 30 years. Um, is I try to focus as much as I possibly can on the the these the uh, the things that I'm uniquely qualified to do and try to outsource the other things, whether it's Upwork or like with the book. I mean, I know how to format in Word. I paid somebody a few hundred dollars to format the book to get it, you know, to put it over the finish line. So now the question is, and so I'm actually now considering for the first time, and I'm going to be 70 years old next month, and I just haven't decided what I want to be when I grow up. I'm actually thinking of hiring a CEO. Um, uh, and, and a CEO would be somebody who has a passion to build a business. Um, and, uh, uh, the, the vision is sort of mine, but I'm going to sort of transfer the, this is for the now be happier platform because there's going to be, you know, we got the app and the TEDx talk, we have lectures and courses and we're probably going to have a certified coaching program and all that. I want to create content and I'm going to go hire somebody to run the, run the business. Somebody has got a passion to make this thing grow, to go, go global and the whole thing, because I enjoy creating content. Now, the more that I will create content, the more I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to be happier. I'm going to be maximizing the number of seconds of my life that I'm enjoying without causing harm. And I'm going to create a job for somebody who's going to just love to, oh, yeah, I want to build a global business. Yeah, I'll be great. So, Mark, if, if, you, if you were consulting me as an entrepreneur or manager or skilled producer, um, would, you, would the advice, some of your best advice be do what you're uniquely qualified to do and that you love to do? That, that is exactly 100% on target. I need a transcript of what you just said, but that's the perfect, that <laughs> and, is the exact word. And, and if I did that, what should transpire? Yeah. So if, you, if you're doing things that are, you're uniquely qualified to do and you enjoy, the first thing is that you're going to enjoy your life. You're going to enjoy, you're going to maximize the number of seconds because in the end, it's not about the money. It's not about anything. Um, it's about uh, enjoying the, your waking hours from now to the end of life, the afterlife is beyond my pay grade. You know, I lived in Jerusalem for 13 years and I don't, so I, I you know, I don't know even that where you know, God was a local phone call, but I, 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 I never figured out the afterlife. So the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to enjoy your life because that's what's important. The second thing that's going to happen is you're going to create so much more value because you're not dealing with things like, Hey, should I, should I use a, a, a Yeti microphone or should I use a, a, a zoom h3 microphone so you're going to be outsourcing that but then you're also going to be creating a job for somebody that they they, they love the whole self-love concept that uh, brad chandler and the how to be happy for entrepreneurs has created and and that person is then 
they're going to build that business and the business will, will thrive. Now, in the end, yes, you do have to be creating value. You do have to be creating value that, that people want, but, but, uh, Hey, who doesn't want to be happy while being an entrepreneur? I, I, I don't think that there's a big market for how to be sad and being an entrepreneur. So you, you've really hit on something that people truly want. You're not forcing people to want it. How to be happy as an entrepreneur. You had then, then I'll be happier than I do. The, the saving money and saving jobs and phase transfer catalysis, the, 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 the helping credit investors and helping non-credit investors build. People want to do this. People want to be simultaneously happy and prosperous. This is what I'm, this is the, the value that I create. This is the value that you create. And, and we're not competing. We're not competing. We actually complement each other. So at the beginning of the conversation, we talked about how you, you define the happiness, uh, uh, score right and and i quickly chimed in and said without self-love it's really impossible to to be happy and you agreed because that means that you would spend more time as you said in the category of waste and on your uh, scoring mechanism so if you're one of those folks and and you're wondering like do i spend a lot of time in waste or do i have these these issues these programming issues from decades ago that are affecting me i created a self-love quiz that you can take it only takes three minutes it's 12 questions Go to bradchandler.com forward slash quiz and take it. Mark, I think you took it. And I took it, I, yes. And I believe you were un- only about six or seven percent of people score extreme self love. Um, and you were one of those people ex- to ex- score extreme, extreme self love. So kudos to you. And on that note, my qu- my next question, and we're wrapping up in a couple of minutes here. Uh, we'll, we'll hit your uh, your your app more in the in the website in a second. But what got you into this whole happiness thing? Were, were were you like this from the day you were born, or did something transpire in your life that you woke up one day and you're like, "I'm going to follow this happiness path"? Oh, that's a that's a great question. Let's see if I can do this quickly. Um, and again, this pod- podcast is not about me, but you know, maybe people can identify with the situation. Uh, when I was a kid, I was a failure at everything. Um, I was uh, the lowest in my class. I, I have, uh, as I talk in my, I opened my TEDx uh, talk uh, with this. Um, I was uh, uh, depressed most of the time, angry uh, a lot of the time, and and I felt worthless all of the time. Uh, I, I got left back in 11th grade, uh, bottom of my class. I was a failure socially, failure academically, um, and uh, it, it was pretty bad, and uh, well, I'll I'll just come out and say, uh, my 21st birthday, I was uh, suicidal because I I didn't think I was worthless. I knew I was worthless. There was wow. just there was no skills or anything. Now, I did go into the military at age 18, and uh, there they it was really really tough psychologically. It was incredible, uh, and uh, but what they taught me in the army is is that I can do things that I know for sure that I can't do. I didn't realize it at the time. Of course, I couldn't get into college. Uh, but my mother, uh, she nagged, she actually went down uh, to, to the Dean's office and she nags, I'm not going until you accept my son. And I got, I got accepted and, uh, unbeknownst to me when the military caused me to think differently then when I got into college, I started succeeding and then mm. things got really good. So un- until my early twenties, I was, a, I was a mess. No, I, I was not born with self-love. Uh, I was <laughs> suicidal i mean it was it, it's the opposite uh, i was self-sabotaging at every at every uh, it, it was it was it was terrible but then at some point uh when i started having some accomplishments i decided i'm going to set a goal i wonder if i could be as good as average I, uh, let's not you know didn't really uh have much hope for it but i said well let's try it and uh and then it turns out that i was actually pretty good at stuff and then once i was uh, pretty good at stuff Oh, and, and then I, I got my first girlfriend in my mid twenties, married her. We've been married now for 43 years. So wow. I'm tremendous. Congratulations. Yep. Uh, and we have not argued since 2010. We argued on the average every five to six years in the first uh, 30 years of marriage. And, um, so it, it was an evolution where I, at some point I realized, so I, I basically went from, uh, uh, you know, in family history, we won't go into, you know, grandparents were murdered. There's a whole bunch of stuff that happened. My father was in slavery for three and a half years. So uh, I, I went from a situation where um, it, it was somewhat difficult psychologically. But then once I realized, holy crap, I can do stuff. Then I was then on a mission to say, how can I help other people? And the, the now be happier thing, it just, again, very, very briefly, I was in a plane from Shanghai to Newark and I had a, it was a 14 and a half hour flight. I watched the movie, watched another movie, another eight hours. What am I going to do? I got paid a lot of money to, to talk in Asia for a few days. They gave me a 
cell phone and a tour guide, a car and a, a translator. And I, I made a lot of money uh, and had a lot of fun. And on the plane on the way back, I decided, what is happy? Why am I so happy? You know, I, mean, I love my job. I love my, you know, I love my career, love my wife, uh, self-actualization, traveling the world. And that's when I, and I actually came up with this, with the whole concept of the happiness score on that flight. That was in 2007. And then, you know, during COVID, we came up with the, with the app. So no, I was not, I, I went from not self-love to it's more than self-doubt. I didn't think that I was worthless. I knew for absolute true I, I, I was worthless. So Mark, and then Mark I, I'm gonna stop I, I want everybody to be happy. I want to stop you there because I'm going to, I'm going to make a point. Uh, I've agreed with everything you said, except for one thing today, and that is that you were born without self-love. I believe everyone was born with self-love, and I believe, and this is a whole other conversation. Maybe I'll have you back on in a couple months because okay. you gave me a little bit of insight. You said your parents had a lot of issues, uh, issues. Your, your dad was a hostage or something, what you said. Uh, there Mark was born a worthy, self-loving individual, and something happened in those formative years that led you to think you were worthless. But you never were worthless, and you never you always had that internal self-love. So again, a topic for another day. As we close, Mark, that's a great uh, point. That's a great point. I'm going to have to think about that. We don't get we don't do another podcast. You're going to cause me to think because as a scientist, I always have taken into account. Uh, alternate opinions. So thank you for this sharing is, that. This, I will I will think about that. Yeah, this is what I've learned over my last um, uh, three years it, doing this work, spending thousands of hours and studying under some of the best people in the world. When we don't get our needs met as children, we come up with stories about those needs not being met. And a lot of times it's, I'm worthless. I'm not good enough. That's why this bad thing is happening to me because that way we can control it because it's our issue. If it's our parents' issue, our caregivers, we're screwed because we can't do anything. So anyway, like I said, we'll, we'll get you back on here. Um, as we close, tell people where they can find this amazing. So you've got amazing app. You've got this this product that will be on the website here shortly uh, to help people kind of find their true purpose and passion in life. Where, where can they find you, Mark? I'm very good. So everything, the, the entire platform with the book and the app and the Ted Lecture, all this kind of stuff, it's on nowbehappier.com. It's easy to spell, nowbehappier.com. The book is called Now Be Happier. And uh, everything, the whole platform is, so it's very simple, nowbehappier.com. And just the last thing, just what you were saying to encourage everybody out there, whether, whether you uh, whether you are practicing self-love or not, you should, because everybody's got that potential. I don't care how worthless you think you are. Everybody has got humongous potential, not just the people that talk about it a lot. Yeah. So please, you must believe in yourself because it's there. And you, maybe you just have to bring it out. And if you're already an entrepreneur, well, now be happy or be more successful. But if some of you are listening to Brad's podcast because you're having some doubt, there's some self-doubt, please understand you, you've you got it. You just got to bring it out. Yes. It's, it's, it's theirs. I know it sounds very Pollyanna, but it is absolutely true. Yeah. You have all you need to be happy right now. Mark, thank you so much. That was incredibly insightful. I really appreciate you. You dropped you know countless gold nuggets. As we come to close for another episode of How to Be Happier, I want you to, to remind you that I'm on a mission to help a million people find freedom and happiness by reversing these limiting beliefs, just like Mark had about around his worthlessness. It wasn't true. He was never worthless. So I need your help. And how I can get your help is just if you like the podcast, please rate it. Please give it a nice five-star review. Please share it, whatever you can do to help spread the word. And in closing, as always, love heals all. Hit subscribe if you don't want to miss out on more life-changing content. And if you're struggling, you don't have to. Go to bradchandler.com slash contact. There, you can join the Facebook community of like-minded entrepreneurs, and you'll see a button to schedule your freedom and happiness call. See you on the next episode.